Hi everybody, it's Dean Miller, the Dog Counselor, and we are live on the Wolf Driver channel. I am, let me see, the framing looks a little small. I hope you can see me. Let me move the camera back a little bit. Ooh, I'm so technical. Look how I zoom in and zoom out. I'm such a pro director here of video. Um, I hope we have some people joining us. If you are just now joining us, or if you're a fan of the Wolf Driver or myself, the Dog Counselor, um, we'd love to hear your questions, your input, anything you have to say, anything you want to ask of us. Um, I am a pro, uh, dog behaviorist, behavior specialist, and trainer, and I'm here to answer all your questions about that if you're uh, ready to send them. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, dog training, dog teaching, and some of my philosophies of that. Um, I've made some notes about things I want to talk about. I want to make you aware of my book, A Dog's Way, which is available at my website, thedogcounselor.com. It's also available on amazon.com, and it, it's, uh, it's subtitled, How Dogs Make Us Better People. And it's really a relationship book. It's a book about um, how we relate to our dogs and how they relate to us and how we can have a better relationship with them. It's not as much a how-to train. It's not as much a sit, stay, lie down type of uh, training behavior book as it is, although th those things are addressed in there. But the book is really more about our relationship with dogs and opening up with them. I just realized I haven't introduced my pal here. This is my buddy Flip, and I have four dogs. Um, if you've been watching these episodes, um, in the first few episodes, you met my dog Kirby, who's a white boxer. Beautiful, beautiful boy. He's about 11 years old. You also met my black and white street dog named Henry. Uh, I've had Henry about 11 years. He's actually now about 12 years old, and he's a good boy. And this is Flip. And I'm saving the best for last. My fourth dog I'm going to um, bring in. Uh, my fourth dog I'll bring in on a future episode is Penny. And Penny is my special needs child. She, uh, for, for being the dog of a trainer, she seems to never learn what she needs to know. As you can see, Flip is pretty darn perfect. Now, some of you may have noticed that Flip is missing an eye. Um, I found Flip when he was about three and a half months old on the street. He was running with his sister Penny, and um, I rescued him, and he um, had lost an eye at that point, or lost the use of an eye. Um, so he can't see out of one eye, but he's still a perfect puppy and really, really good. I love Flip. So, um, let's get right to it. I am, uh, first of all, going to talk to you about um, some of my philosophies of training. And I'm a person who believes that when you train a dog, it's not as much about what you do. It's not as much about the actual techniques as it is about who you are and what you're presenting. What, what is your relationship to the dog? So I often say that dogs aren't listening to your words and the meaning of the words as much as they're um, looking at what you're presenting. So am I presenting a strong presentation, a weak presentation, a submissive, fearful presentation, an assertive, dominant presentation? They're looking at how you, um, how you are interacting, how you are being. And um, that's very animal. See, humans have done this thing over the years of evolution where we, we work from our mind, we work with words, we work with reasoning and thought and I'm going to talk something through with you and then you think about it and then I put images in your head and we talk back and forth. Well, that's not really how a dog is wired. A dog is wired um, based on living in the moment, which is a beautiful thing we can learn from dogs, is to live in the moment, not project into the future, not be held back by the past, but just live in the moment. But they have the kind of mind that's very reactionary, uh, very associative, they, their mind associates with what's going on. So if you do something that associates with something bad that's happened to them, then um, that's an issue that we have. Um, uh, then that's the way their mind works. It's a better way to train to, to sort of uh, be aware of that. Um, so that's what I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit is when you're training your dog, we want to think about who we are and what we're presenting more than what is the meaning of our words. So, so for example, you'll hear somebody yell at their dog, I told you to get off the couch. Well, your dog doesn't know prepositions and nouns and pronouns and you know all of these things in a sentence structure. They're responding to your tone, your sound, your manner of being, your, uh, your posture, so many other things that aren't about the meaning of the words. 
So I always say, um, if I can give one really big important piece of advice to people when they're teaching their dogs, is I would say train from a position of empathy. Empathy is where you want to position yourself from. Um, we think how your dog might be viewing something. Think of what your dog might be going through. Is your dog hearing the same way you are, feeling the same way you are, thinking the same way you are, and probably they're not probably not filtering through through your eyes. So if you can start to see the world through their eyes and their point of view, you're gonna have much more success instead of trying to impose your will upon them, impose your way of thinking upon them. You're gonna have much more success if you think in terms of communicating to them where they are from, from their point of view. So um, we wanna meet the dog where they are. We don't wanna just set the bar really high and start yelling at them in English and hoping they understand what we're trying to get at. You know. So empathy is a really, really important thing. I would say, for example, if you think in terms of a, a rescue dog, for example, who's had a, a bad background, a sad background, maybe that dog's been abused or neglected or, or had, had some sadness in their past. Well, we don't want to just grab that dog and yell at him and start, you know, telling him what to do and, and having huge expectations. We have to have empathy for what they've been through. And that's a great lesson dogs can teach us about life and about treatment of other people. Have some empathy for other people and what they've been through. Um, and this really brings me to a point I want to bring up. I, I kind of jump around a lot, so I hope you'll forgive me, but I hope you get some little nuggets out of the, the topics that I jump around with with my brain. But uh, when I think about rescue dogs and when we get rescue dogs and having empathy um, a lot of times you'll see a fearful rescue dog or a dog that's shut down and then you'll begin saying commands to them uh, sit stay lie down or, or things you want from the dog and often the dog freezes or shuts down or seems not to be learning but one of the things that we sometimes forget is that when a dog has been abused they are often abused in association with the words that we use to command or to ask them to do something. So you'll often see a lot of people say, sit, I told you to sit, you know, or no, or lie down, or get out of here, or come here, you know, and, and, and they become words associated with abuse. So if you're saying these commands and these words with your dog that you've just adopted from a sad background, and, and maybe they're reacting in a way that you think is strange, Try to have some empathy, try to have some patience and think what they might have been through and what they might have seen associated with those words. So that's an incredible place to start. That's a beautiful place to start when you're working with a rescue dog or a dog that has not had a, a kind, loving home before. You may be the first love this dog has experienced. Your house may be the first time the dog has experienced quiet, love, a warm bed, solid, uh, regular meals. You know, these are all things that can be shocking to a dog uh, that, that has never been through it. So it can be just as shocking to a dog to be treated well as it can be shocking to be treated badly. So it's, it's just something to consider if you're having trouble when you're uh, training your new rescue dog. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is um, our expectations. Whether the dog is a rescue, whether the dog is a puppy, whether the dog is new to you, whatever, we need to stop having ridiculous expectations of our dogs. It's the most common problem I see in training. People set the bar really high. They, they have some idea of what it's like to adopt a puppy or a dog and bring it into their home. And then the dog goes to the bathroom on the rug or they chew something up and the person flips out and, you know, takes the dog to the shelter or gives up on the dog because they made a mistake. People have ridiculous expectations and you have to treat your dog like a child. You have to treat your dog like they have a brain that doesn't reason the same way a human does. You have to have patience. You have to acclimate your dog to you and your family and your home. You have to take it slow and easy and carefully. Um, you can't just expect the dog to come into your house prepackaged. How should the dog know? People tend to forget something really, really important, and that is that your dog is an animal. Your dog is a dog. Your dog is not a human being. Your dog doesn't even have the part of the brain that makes verbal language. They don't say words. They don't communicate in words and thoughts and, and long sentences and paragraphs. So to expect your dog to understand things that you haven't walked them through 
in a way that a dog's mind understands is a ridiculous expectation. Um, so for those of you who just joined us, I'm going to take a little moment here to remind you this is my dog Flip. We are on the Wolf Driver channel, which the logo is right here. And I'm Dean Miller, who uh, is also known as the Dog Counselor, author of A Dog's Way, which you can uh, find at my website, thedogcounselor.com or on amazon.com. Um, but we're talking about dog training and dog teaching, and I'm here uh, twice a week. And I come on for about a half an hour, and I talk with you and answer your questions and, and just kind of talk uh, back and forth about ideas about training. Now, we have quite a few people on here. I'm going to try to get to some of your comments here. I need to lean up in the camera. This is my older bad eyesight that I have to take my glasses off and lean in the camera to get to, to read the screen here. But um, I see some people saying hello to my dog and how well behaved he is. You know, people say, how's your dog so well behaved? And I say, well, his dad is a dog trainer, so it kind of goes pretty well. Um, although, I will tell you this, and I alluded to this earlier. I have one dog that is just... Uh, difficult. Not difficult in a mean way or a challenging way, but she has the brain of Lucille Ball or something. I mean, I really think she's kind of just bleh, all over the place. So I may bring her on sometime to just encourage you to realize that we can all have a dog that frustrates us and it doesn't mean we don't love them. It's just my my frustrating family member that is a little bit off the charts with her silliness. And so I may bring her on. Her name is Penny, and she may be on next week, and we'll talk about um, challenges. Maybe we'll talk about challenges next week with Penny, and I'll use her as an example. Sorry to, sorry to do that to you, Penny, but um, she, can, she may be an example and an encouragement to some of you guys. So let's see. Um, I'm seeing a whole lot of comments here, like your nice dog and hi and hello, et cetera, et cetera. But I would love to hear your comments and questions about training. Something I might be able to answer for you, something you might want to ask about training. If anyone has any questions about training, I'd be happy to answer the questions. Or, you know, if you want to know what the capital of Montana is, I'll try to answer that too. Any questions you have, you just please type them in right here live on Facebook. We are live broadcasting. And so I'm here to answer all your questions about behavior and training with dogs. So let's jump on to, uh, oh, I was talking about ridiculous expectations before. I may use as an example, I always use this uh, as an example from, from my training before. I once had a couple call me and they said, um, we need you to train our dog that's going to the bathroom in the house. And so I got to their house and it was an apartment. It was a one bedroom apartment. They had a poodle. Poodle's name was Diamond. They had a kennel crate in the kitchen, and they kept their dog in the kennel all day while they were at work, eight hours a day. Then they came home after work, and they would tie the dog outside their porch onto a line, which went about 10 feet out of the yard, and the dog would go to the bathroom and run around on the line. They would bring the dog in. They told me they didn't want the dog to ever exit the kitchen, so they had the dog on the kitchen linoleum, and it was never allowed to walk anywhere else in the house, and if it did, they would punish the dog. And then when they went to bed, they put the dog back in the kennel. So as you can probably see, that's a horrible, horrible life for a dog. And they were concerned about the dog going to the bathroom on their rug. And I said, well, I would go to the bathroom on your rug too if you made me live a life like that. It, that is a terrible way to be with a dog. So I encourage them uh, uh, to have a more healthy relationship with their dog and how to live with their dog. And um, I said the bathroom habits will clear up when the dog begins getting the dog's needs fulfilled. People often forget to fulfill their dog's needs. Dogs have needs the same way humans do. They're just different needs than human needs. So I found it astounding that these people could own a dog and not research what the needs of the dog are. So um, again, lower your expectations, have reasonable expectations of a dog, raise the bar as the dog learns. You know, we've got to learn to walk before we run. We've got to learn to run before we drive. We've got to learn to drive before we go on the freeway. Step by step by step, baby steps, okay? So let me get to some of these questions here. People are coming in. Um, we have here, uh, okay, so here's something that I think is, is interesting, and I just want to throw this out there. People ask some really complicated training questions um, and then want a quick answer, and there are no quick answers to training. I'll give you some tips, I'll give you some ideas, but I just want you to know that there is no substitute for um, repeated, regular teaching uh, and, and having a professional come to your home because that's another good point is that dogs learn differently at home 
in their own environment than they do at a class. I think a class is fine for socialization, for learning sit, stay, lie down behaviors, but if you're having, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, problems, um, you know, f fighting or difficulty or challenges, I think there's no substitute for learning at home. But I will give you some tips, I'll give you some ideas, just remember to consult a professional. You can consult me, I do also do Skype, uh, consultations, I do phone consultations, and I travel anywhere in the world to train. If you want to fly me somewhere in the world, I'd be happy to work with you and your dog. So let me let me take some of these questions. Um, one of the questions here is, my dog tears up and eats his beds all the time. Why? Well, there's not always a consistent why to that question, but sometimes a dog just likes to, you know, like you like to fluff up the bed or make it more comfortable or do something fun or put, your, put their smell on it, you know, or dig into it because it's great and it's exciting. Maybe there's something within that bedding that's interesting. There are maybe 50 or 100 different reasons why that dog might tear up the bed. But it's really hard to say to a dog, here's your bed, here's something of your own, now don't tear it up. So it's like giving a child a toy and then saying don't play with it. Um, you can gently guide the dog not to tear up the bed if you watch, and then as the dog is beginning to tear up the bed, say no, give a correction, hand the dog something they are supposed to chew on, a toy or something like that, and then praise the dog gently for taking the toy instead of chewing on the bed. If you want to really encourage the toy over the bed, you can put a little something that smells or tastes good onto the toy, so you might rub a little bologna on the toy, you might rub a little cheese on the toy, you don't have to coat it in it, you just have to put a little smell on it. It indicates to the dog that this is exciting, this is mine, and this is where I should put my mouth. So that is um, something to consider too. Then you put the toy on the bed when the dog goes to use the bed, and that's going to be a more interesting thing to chew on than the bed, hopefully. Uh, but if you start to see the, the chewing of the bed, you want to gently but firmly say no and then hand them the thing they are supposed to chew and praise that. That's a, a, in a nutshell, but every dog is a little different and I could help more if I see your dog and meet your dog. So if you wanna talk about that further, I'd be happy to help. Let's see here, what's the best way to train your dog not to bark? Okay, one of the most common mistakes people make is when their dog is barking, they tend to make too much sound. They tend to say, no, stop barking, stop it, yelling, lots of yelling. And um, dogs bark for many different reasons, many different tones, but when a dog, uh, oftentimes a dog is barking to alert the rest of their pack that something's going on. So if your dog is barking, oftentimes they're trying to get you to know, hey, somebody's out here, hey, there's a squirrel, something threatening's happening, something exciting's happening. And when you start saying, no, no, stop it, the dog feels like, good, I've got somebody else's attention, we're all barking, we'll scare this thing away. Well. <laughs> you're actually joining the barking. So you don't want to join the barking and be another one of the dogs in the pack barking. You want to give one low, short, sharp bark. And it sounds a little bit like this. Hey, no. You don't want to say, no, 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 no. It's, it's no, with silence after it. Hey, silence after it. That silence helps the dog to compute and learn what it is you want from them. And the sound is that of a corrective bark as opposed to a warning bark, a sad bark, a mean bark. A one low sharp bark is, a, is an authoritative bark. Now if I've done that once or twice with some silence in between and the dog has not responded or is not barking, I mean it's not stopped barking, then I don't want to keep doing it over and over again because when you keep saying no, no, stop, no, quit, don't, you are encouraging the dog to not listen to you. You're showing the dog that you don't enforce the command. So if you've said no and the dog doesn't listen, you want to go over to where the dog is in silence. No sound, just go to where they are, step between them and whatever they're barking at, face the dog, and then touch them with the end of your finger, touch them abruptly on the shoulder, like you would jab somebody in the shoulder. Hey, not hard, not mean, just quick jab and say no. And what you're doing is adding a physical correction to your verbal correction, and they will associate that with your verbal correction. So if a dog is gonna make a, a correction, they'll nip 
or, or do what we call a muzzle punch. They'll take their muzzle and poke that other dog and that physical correction reinforces the point that they're not supposed to do it. So if you've said no and you give the physical correction, you are really emphasizing in the way of a bark and a nip, the way a dog understands they're not supposed to do that. And if they're gonna keep doing it, you're gonna to move toward them and move them out of the way of whatever it is they're barking at. But the, you're then showing them, excuse me, that you uh, enforce what you ask, you enforce what you say. So that's, that's in a nutshell. And again, I can help you further if you decide you wanna to go to thedogcounselor.com. We can set up a Skype visit, a phone visit, or I do travel for training. I've been flown all over the country to, to train for different people. So I'd be happy to do that if you'd like to do it. Let me look at some of these other questions here. Hello from Bakersfield, California. I heard y'all are having fires out in Bakersfield. I hope everything's okay. That is the home of my favorite kind of music, uh, the Bakersfield sound, Merle Haggard and Buck Owens. So I love Bakersfield and would love to get back sometime. I hope you guys are doing well out there. Um, let's see here. My two dogs often fight. One is aggressive toward the other. She doesn't want her to walk by, doesn't want to share, etc. Uh, also, the same dog gets mad when I go to work or to the store and don't take her, and she uses the bathroom almost immediately, aims as if to spite me. Okay, this sounds like a, a real confusion in what I call the pack order. Who's the alpha? Who's the beta? Who's the leader? Who's the follower? And it sounds like you need to do some things to establish that you're the mom and the dog is the kid and that we need to reestablish that order because it sounds like the dog has, has sort of begun to take over but the urinating and the other things tend to imply to me that it's um, the dog is being an, an alpha, but in an erotic way and not in a confident way. So you need to be a confident alpha leader to that dog so that the dog will step down, relax, and give you the authority. Um, that This is easier to show you, to demonstrate. I'd be happy to come and train for you and do a Skype session. Um, but you can contact me through thedogcounselor.com. Um, and I would be happy to set up a lesson with you and, and try to help you with this. But don't get yourself into a dangerous situation between two dogs. What often happens is that this creeps up on us. It probably started small, a few little infractions, dirty looks, things like that. And we missed them. And so the dog went to the next level and the next level until now it's a problem that's a little bit out of control. I can certainly help you with it. It sounds to me like a very solvable problem but I would have to show you. Um, so I do travel for my training and I do do Skype sessions if you wanna set that up at thedogcounselor.com. My email is dean at thedogcounselor.com and I'd be happy to help you. Let me check some more of these. I know I'm getting up in the camera here and it's really weird, but that's the only way I can read what you guys are sending me. Um, let's see here. I have an American Bulldog just a little over a year now, but I still have a hard time housebreaking her. I'm home with her all day. She goes out on walks and potties, but we'll still come back in a couple of hours later and potty on the floor. What can I do? Okay, here's a couple of things about house training. I would say that um, one of the big mistakes that's implied in your question is you say we go out for a walk. Well, I'm a firm believer in we go out with a dog to a spot and that spot is three or four feet wide well you know not exact but it's a, a little spot and you're on a leash and the dog is not allowed to walk or go anywhere else until they use the bathroom so you're going to say to the dog a command whether it's go potty do your business whatever you want it to be but you're going to say go potty no other no other words don't confuse the issue be real quiet just say the command go potty go potty when the dog goes to the bathroom jackpot we can then go for a walk we can then go explore we can go visit disneyland because outside is like disneyland to the dog if we just go walking we're not teaching the dog where to go to the bathroom we're just saying anywhere you choose just pick a place to go to the bathroom but if the dog returns to the same spot over and over again and is not allowed to move forward until they've used the bathroom that dog that spot begins to smell like a toilet and the smell tells the dog this is what we're here for and if you're quiet and don't do anything the dog starts to realize the party doesn't start until I use this toilet. So they start to do it on command. Then you move forward, then you explore, then you do things. Then, if the dog doesn't do that, first of all, you're gonna go back in the, in the crate or kennel for 10 or 15 minutes to try it again until the dog does go to the bathroom. But you don't celebrate or talk or do a bunch of stuff until the dog learns. But uh, here's a tip for you. Um, people always say the dog went to the bathroom outside, I bring the dog in and suddenly the dog goes to the bathroom. 
Well, when the dog is in the house the first few minutes, to me that's the most likely time the dog's gonna go to the bathroom because they are in what I call marking mode. They've been outside moving and hunting and peeing on trees and bushes and they're saying, well, I'll make this mailbox smell like me and I'll make this tree smell like me and they're marking everything to comfort themselves, to tell other dogs that they've been there. Then they have a little saved up so when they come in, they can say, okay, I'm gonna mark that chair and that table and that carpet so I can make my house smell like me and smell comfortable and good. So the the time you're back in the house, they're still in marking mode. So they're uh, really uh, in that animal frame of mind and it's the most likely time they're probably gonna use the bathroom. So watch your dog extra specially close when you're first back in the house the first few minutes. Let me see here. Um, my pop, puppy follows me and follows me in the bathroom and makes me hold her. Well, you're saying something in that phrase that I think is uh, very telling. You said she makes me hold her. Well, a dog can't make you hold her. A dog uh, may guilt you into it or you may project something onto that and pick her up. But you can also say no and disagree with it and correct it. So my puppy follows me everywhere and I kind of like it. Uh, Flip follows me places. My other dogs follow me places. I, I feel comforted by it. But if it's too much or... Um, you know, or something like that, you know, then you can certainly correct it. But anytime the dog comes to you and acts a certain way, and then you pick the dog up and hold the dog, then that dog is learning that I'll do this behavior and that'll make you hold me. So the dog is inadvertently training you in reverse. You're going to have to figure out how to correct that if you don't like that behavior. So let's see what else we have here. So, oh, lots of comments coming in. Uh, something about a new house. I don't know what I missed here. Uh, I missed something about a new house. Um, okay. Um, let's see. I don't know what that means. I have a new house. Oh, uh, you say uh, follows me, but I have a new house. Well, uh, that's probably pro why the dog's following you. The dog's getting comfortable with the house and, and wanting your leadership and, and, and guidance. So they're probably a little nervous in the new house. But they're, they're not comforted as much by loving stuff when they're in a new place. They want to be led and shown, you know, that you're strong and you control the new place. And I think that's going to help comfort the dog, too. Um, I can't leave the house or else my dog will freak. What do I do? Freak out barking. What do I do? Well, we have to correct that. But you can't do it all at once. It's, it's a form of separation anxiety. And you have to break it down into baby steps. You can't just go zero to leaving the house. You have to break it down. I can easily teach you that, but um, we'll have to set up a Skype lesson or I'll have to travel to, to meet you. But I, I definitely have huge success with separation anxiety. And I can definitely help you with that if you'd like me to. Again, contact me through thedogcounselor.com, dean at thedogcounselor.com. And I'll be happy to talk to you about that and help you out. I have an English Bulldog, seven years old, extremely aggressive to other animals except the two dogs he lives with. Even though he was socialized as a puppy, he's tried to kill every dog. Um, this is a very serious problem and he's about 60 some pounds. How do I stop him? I think that's really interesting when people say my dog is killing other dogs and aggressive and hardcore, how do I stop him? I, I can't really give you a two minute answer of how to stop him. I have to come to your home for a minimum of 90 minutes and teach you some stuff and assess the dog and work with you, which I'd be happy to do. So if you wanna book me for a session, I can certainly help you with aggressive dogs. It's a, it's a very serious matter. You can get, people can get hurt, people can get sued. It can be a liability. It can be a danger to, to dogs and other people. So the sooner you address it, the better. Um, many trainers give you harsh methods or false methods, but I've had great success and I don't use either. And I could certainly help you with that. So if you'd like to contact me through the dogcounselor.com, I can help you with your aggressive bulldog. Let's see here. My Yorkie goes crazy with the barking when I come home. I can't step in the hallway and he barks so loud. That is very solvable um, when you come home. Um, but you're probably doing things you don't realize you're doing that inadvertently ramp it up instead of calm it down which I can also teach you about, but I have to meet the particular dog, see the particular behaviors, and guide you through it, which I can do. Um, so if you wanna set up a Skype meeting or contact me through the dogcounselor.com, I can give you a more extensive answer than I can one minute on here. But um, definitely it has to do with uh, coming in your home, being calm, being quiet, not loving on your dog, doing corrections that a dog understands, and then giving them